We are about to talk about one of my personal favorite failure modes. That sounds kind of bad. Maybe I shouldn't say it like that. Um, but it is an interesting one. Um, we're going to go through a number of case studies this morning. And um, let's see here. Just going to let me advance. Maybe. Aha. Okay. Um, so for this presentation, there are a few learning objectives. We're going to talk about the mechanisms that affect overtopping and wave overwash. We're going to talk about how to construct an event tree that represents overtopping. And we're going to talk about the probability of breach and um, the probabilities that have to do with fragility curves. Now, uh, we used to use the word fragility curves a lot more commonly for this type of thing, but now I, I believe the term that we would probably want to use is system response probability or SRP. So if you see fragility curves on any of these slides, that's synonymous with SRP. So just something to keep in mind. Okay. So failure of dams and levees due to overtopping is a very common failure mode as we discussed the other day. Embankments overtopped by a few inches to a foot or more have performed well, but some have failed very quickly. Um, especially older dams and levees may design, be designed for floods that are no longer um, representing a remote flood. In other words, we may have updated the hydrology and we may now have a different understanding of what the um, extreme floods in that basin might be. And so perhaps the design of the dam or the levee is no longer adequate um, for that design. So let's talk about, let's look at several case studies. This is always a, a big favorite of mine. Hopefully it's enjoyable to you as well. Um, this one is Lake Delhi Dam near Delhi, Iowa. Um, this dam failed on July 24th, 2010. Uh, one of the spillway gates was not operational and the dam underwent internal erosion. Um, the specifics are unknown. And it was overtopped, causing a 200-foot portion of the earthen embankment and roadway to breach, emptying the entire reservoir, which had a total capacity of 3,790 acre feet. Uh, luckily, no life loss occurred, but about 8,000 people were evacuated downstream. Here's another one, Auburn Cofferdam failure. In early February 1986, 10 inches of rain fell on the Sacramento region in 11 days, which melted the Sierra Nevada snowpack and caused a huge flood to pour down the American River. Rising water overtopped the cofferdam near the right abutment, creating a waterfall that quickly eroded into the structure. Although the cofferdam was designed with a soft earth earthen plug to fail in a controlled manner, if any such event were to occur, the structure eroded quicker than was expected and the breach outflow surged downstream into the already spilling Folsom Lake Dam, which was less than a mile downstream. Okay. Um, sorry, got to move some things around in my presentation here. Okay. Um, so when that breach occurred, it deposited the coffer dam material and debris, um, which raised the lake level suddenly at Folsom Dam and increased the outflow um, to 134,000 CFS, which exceeded the design capacity of the levees throughout Sacramento. However, the levees were not overtopped and the severe flooding in the city was averted by a very close margin. Here's another one may, some of you may be familiar with. Tom Sock Upper Dam is a pump storage dam and it was overtopped when water continued to be pumped from the lower reservoir after the upper was full. This led to catastrophic failure of a triangular section of the reservoir wall. The failure was a result of a combination of design and construction flaws, including continuing to operate the dam when the primary system for gauging of the water level was known to be inaccurate. The gauging pipes had become detached from the reservoir wall. Moving the fail-safe secondary gauging system above the actual height of the dam to avoid false positives, which would have caused a premature stop of pumping into the reservoir. And they continued operating the dam in an unsafe manner by routinely overfilling the reservoir. There was no overflow spillway in the original reservoir. Happily, no one was killed, but a downstream park superintendent, his wife, and three children were swept away while still in their home. <laughs> Imagine that was a pretty crazy day. Um, the dam at the lower reservoir, which by design was able to hold much of the capacity of the upper reservoir, withstood the onslaught of the flood 
and was able to store most of the deluge deluge um, and spared the downstream towns. Um, okay. The next one is Rainbow Lake Dam failure. Rainbow Lake Dam failed in September 1986 due to extreme rainfall in central Michigan. It failed. Um, it was 46 feet tall, 800 feet long, and had a 30 foot wide crest with four on one slopes and a rectangular drop inlet spillway, but no emergency spillway. It was constructed of well compacted silty clay, uh, sorry, sandy silty clay, containing an amount of very coarse gravel. The dam failed after being overtopped for about 14 hours, and the max overtopping depth was 1.5 to 2 feet. An eyewitness stated that the erosion which resulted in the breach and the failure of the embankment started in an area where vegetation cover was sparse or non-existent. It's pretty important. Hope you noticed that. Um, and there was, uh, there, the reason that it was sparse is because there was a, the, a road there um, that angled down the downstream side of the embankment. It was kind of a trail that they had created. Um, and this was one of 14 dam failures from this event. Laurel Run Dam failed on July 20th, 1977 from a large flood, and the cause of the failure was attributed to inadequate spillway design and stability issues. Um, the issues in the stability were first identified in 1943. A dam assessment in 1959 noted that the spillway was less than half the size desired by the state. In 1970, the dam was classified as high hazard which meant that a failure would cause significant or had potential to cause significant life loss and property damage. In mid-July of 1977, torrential storms hit the Johnstown area, dropping up to 11.8 inches of rain in just eight hours. This equated to approximately a 500 year storm. And by 1.20 AM, water reached the top of the dam and began to spill over the dam crest. By approximately 2.15 AM, on July 20th, 1977, overtopping of Laurel Run Dam scoured the downstream slope of the dam enough to cause the embankment to breach, resulting in a complete failure of the dam. 40 lives were lost in the town of Tanneryville, Pennsylvania, all within the first 2.5 miles downstream. There were virtually no warnings for those in the flood path. If you note, there are some lineations on the downstream side of the dam that are thought to be due to crib walls um, that made up the original dam prior to the placement of additional fill later in the life of the dam. Um, this one uh, has some information on this slide and we'll see a picture on the next slide. Gibson Dam was constructed in 1928. It's a concrete arch dam that's 199 feet high. June uh, 6 through 8, 1964, there was a record regional rainstorm in northern Montana and it was one of the PMP defining events for HMR 55A and HMR 57. Um, and that rainfall fell on heavy snowpack. Spillway radial gates were not fully open, which led to overtopping. And the controls were inaccessible. So two of the gates were completely open, two of the gates were completely closed, and two of the gates were partially open. It overtopped by about three feet over the parapet wall for 20 hours, but it did not fail. Notice the right abutment overflow. So let's look at a picture. Holy cow, look at this. <laughs> that is insane. <laughs> so that's, that's the dam overtopping. And here's another picture. Um, this dam was modified in 1981 to allow overtopping by up to 12 feet. Abutment protection and anchors were added. Notice the concrete apron placement on the right abutment. And if you would like to read more about that one, you can find the details in I Cold Bulletin 82 on spillways from 1992. All right, so here's another one that's pretty um, well known Hurricane Katrina Levy and Flood Wall Breach. So on the left side, we can see the south eye wall breach along the east side of IHNC, which was likely due to rotational failure of the eye wall after overtopping floodwaters scoured the soil supporting the backside of flood protection. So you can kind of actually see in that picture, there's a, there's a looks like there's a portion that's rotated out. Um, the flood wall, the flood control structure in this area has been replaced by a T wall. The residential area behind the failed wall is the lower ninth ward. 
and you can see um, Bayou Bienvenue off to the left. On the right hand side, the picture shows a section of eroded levees along the northeast edge of St. Bernard Protected Basin, fronting both Lake, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, so please excuse me, um, Lake Borg, Borgna, I have no idea how you say that, sorry, and the MRGO, which is the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet Channel. The land side is to the left and the water side is to the right. The embankment was approximately 15 to 17 feet in height. This levee sec section was constructed primarily with hydraulic fill materials that were dredged from the adjacent channel with little to no compaction. Flood control structures in this area have been replaced with large T walls on clay levee sections. All right, so here's another one. And the point of this slide is that not all levees do fail when they're overtopped. On the left hand side, we see a clay levee being overtopped by an unknown amount while being subject to a storm driven overwash, wave overwash. This levee is on the south side of the New Orleans East area along the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. The concrete structures seen are bridge supports for the Paris Road Bridge, or I 510, and the levee was damaged but did not fail. On the right hand side, this is pretty impressive to me. Um, the levee show it, the image shows a levee along the east flank of the New Orleans East. This levee along this section was constructed using clayey Pleistocene soils that were properly compacted at or near optimum moisture moisture content. For reference, just southwest of this location, there were five more um, major erosional breach, excuse me erosional breaches of levees that were constructed of hydraulic fill that were also um, composed flood risk re reduction for the same area and this levee did not breach and it actually doesn't show very much damage at all. That was pretty impressive to me. Um, there are two ways that dams or levees overtop overwash or continuous overtopping overwash occurs when wind driven waves wash over the dam crest. Overtopping is a rising water level and continuous depth of water over the crest of the levee or the dam. A word about wave attack versus wave overwash. Wave attack progressively erodes the upstream side of the embankment until the crest is lowered. Um, and then constant overtopping begins. Typical embankment slopes are designed to minimize damage that can be done by wave attack. Wave overwash is progressively erodes the crest and the downstream side of the slope. Um, on the embankment. Freeboard requirements are typically placed on embankment de designs to protect from wave overwash. It's typically considered, wave overwash is typically considered to have a higher likelihood of causing enough erosion to cause a lowering of the dam. Overtopping occurs from a combination of the still water level and the wind setup exceeding the crest of the dam. For overwash, wind setup and wave run up intermittently combine to produce a water level exceeding the crest of the dam. Typically, a significant surface area upstream fetch is required to allow wind to develop waves that would be directed towards the embankment and overtop it. Overtopping depth and duration and type of structure are the critical factors to evaluating this PFM. Rainbow Dam uh, is the dam that failed by being overtopped by 14 hours with a max overtopping depth of 1.5 to 2 feet. We talked about a little bit earlier. And Gibson Dam um, had overtopping of 3 feet over a parapet wall for 20 hours, but it didn't fail. So we, we saw kind of both examples of failing versus not failing. And we'll talk about the embankment processes and the event trees for um, simple situations as well as concrete dams. The actual mechanism of breaching is shown on the left, um, and that is a head cutting failure. Note the vertical face of the head cut that forms due to the presence of cohesion in the embankment material. So in these pictures on the left hand side, those graphics are for cohesive materials. And on the right hand side, those are for cohesionless materials. So notice the difference in what happens um, when we have a uh, breach for those two different types of materials. Um, the breaching mechanism on the left is a surface erosion failure, typically seen in a, oh sorry, the breaching mechanism on the right is a surface erosion failure typically seen in cohesionless embankment materials. Both mechanisms may be applicable, and this is important, if your dam has cohesionless shells and a cohesive core. So keep that in mind if you have um, different 
properties within the uh, cross section of your dam. All right, so the erosion processes, there are four that we're gonna talk about here. These are the primary four embankment erosion processes that require modeling in the four stages of erosion. The first one on the top left is surface detachment. The second one is impinging jet scour. The third is widening. And the fourth is head cut migration. Surface detachment is the primary driver in all four processes. But when speaking of the surface detachment above, the primary focus in number one is channel stress driven surface detachment, which results in down cutting in a uniform fashion along the slope. Impinging jet scour is a function of the peak stress applied by the impinging jet. The rate of widening is dependent on whether channel surface detachment or head cut migration is occurring. If head cut migration is occurring, then the rate of widening within a simplified breach model or Simba is dependent on the rate of head cut migration. If downward channel erosion is occurring, then the rate of widening is a function of the hydraulic stress occurring in the bed of the channel. Okay, so this, these are pretty interesting. So these pictures illustrate an overtopping event and head cut initiation, migration breach and failure of an embankment at the ARS outdoor laboratory. Actually, there's one more picture. So on the left hand side, the very first picture that illustrates initiation. So there was some kind of nick point and head cut has initiated. In the second picture, we have a picture of head cut actually migrating up towards the dam. So you can see that there's a vertical face and there's suddenly a waterfall that's coming over um, the embankment. And then we actually have a breach where you can see the water level that used to be retained by that embankment. And then you can see the failure of the embankment in the bottom picture where we've lost the pool that used to be retained by that embankment. So that's a really nice, a nice graphic at the USDS outdoor labs. Sorry, did I say that right? Yeah, USDS, okay. I actually don't know that answer, but that's a good question. Um, I also don't know what the composition of that embankment was. Um, so that's, I, I bet we could find out though. That's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, so in, important things to keep in mind. So crest elevation is an important thing when you are doing modeling. Uh, we need to have accurate elevations across the embankment, any dikes or pertinent structures or levee crests that are involved in the dam, the damming surface. And we need to use that so that we can evaluate overtopping. So it's really important to use the most recent survey that you have for a dam. And that helps identify low spots and areas vulnerable to flow concentrations. The hydrologic hazard curve allows us to know the frequency of overtopping, and that's the primary factor in the PFM. There are several factors which may increase water surface elevations, and these can include things like debris blockage, system operation changes, or tributary inflows. Um, sometimes the original modeling technique is different than the one that we would use now, so we would have different understandings of the inflow. Um, we might have revised our PMF for the dam and have a different understanding of the amount of water we would expect to be inflowing. Um, there may have been crest settlement over the course of time that may increase the likelihood of overtopping. There may have been additional structures added to the dam, such as bridges or other encroachments that might change the behavior that was originally assumed when it was designed. And there may be changes in the channel roughness. So that would be probably more applicable to levees. But those are some things to really consider when you're evaluating overtopping failure modes. Um, here's some other important factors that can influence the likelihood of overtopping. Depth and duration are the key factors that you really want to keep in mind. Um, and the next is, is the flow concentration locations. Where do you expect uh, turbulence to form? And then you also want to keep in mind the materials of the downstream slope, the geometry of the embankment, and how high the embankment crest is in, along the surface of the damming surface. Um, so I think that pretty much covered. I think there's some other things here too as well. So you want to consider if there is embankment crest materials that's protecting the crest that might give some more resilience. Um, you want to consider wave, wave setup sorry, wind setup and wave run up and the fetch that would be necessary to develop it. Um, 
You might initially assume that any overtopping depth would initiate erosion progression to breach for a lower order study. So that's something to keep in mind when you're doing different levels of study, you're going to approach this failure mode a little bit differently. So if you're at the one of the screening level studies, you might go ahead and assume that any kind of overtopping is going to initiate breach. Um, the fragility curves or system response curves that should be developed specifically for your site characteristics and the structure. Um, if you have eye walls, if there's a parapet wall, that's an eye wall. Um, you may want to look at whether there's a splash pad on the other side or not, or surface protection, because that can undermine, if there isn't the presence of that, that can undermine the stability of that wall, and then it might be vulnerable to overtopping. Um, if you have transitions from one type of flood protection to another, um, that might be an indication of something to watch out for. And if you have poor performance that's recorded at your structure, that's another thing to be aware of. Also, if there are outlets, if, if we're talking about a damming structure, um, if there are outlets, do they still operate? Sometimes those um, don't work anymore for some reason, or maybe parts have been removed. Um, I know in the Johnstown dam failure that I talked about the other day, um, they had actually removed their outlet works and sold them for scrap metal. Seems like a good idea, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, okay, the sequence of events that lead to an embankment failure from overtopping are listed as follows. A flood occurs that causes the river reservoir level to rise above the crest of the embankment and overtopping initiates. After overtopping, by the way, pay attention to this wording because you too will get to write a description of an overtopping failure mode today. I know you're so excited. Uh, after overtopping has initiated, vegetation and or slope protection is removed upon reaching its critical shear stress. Erosion of the embankment is initiated along the downstream slope of a cohesionless embankment or at the downstream end of the crest or a change in slope for a cohesive embankment and head cut forms. The next step is particle transport or head cut advances to the upstream end of the crest and can deepen and widen at the same time. And then the embankment is lowered and eventually breach occurs. So let's talk about how to put together an event tree and how to inform our understanding and judgment of these nodes. The level of detail in the hydraulic modeling for this failure mode and how the successive events should be evaluated will depend on the level of study that's being undertaken. For a lower level study, hydraulic modeling approximately indicates what frequency a dam experiences. Sorry, that should be hydrologic modeling. Um, what, what frequency of um, overtopping you might expect and the depth of overtopping that might occur in when evaluating. So a lot of times we'll have some hydraulic modeling that will give us some depth and duration. So we'll have an understanding of how long we might expect there to be overtopping for a particular event. Um, for higher level studies, we're gonna do some hydraulic modeling as well to generate rainfall in the basin. We're gonna route and develop, um, we're gonna develop a hydrograph that we route um, and then we're gonna evaluate using probably a model like Windam C to estimate failure initiation and progression. So in these nodes, you can see there are three nodes in this particular one. And um, the first one are the stages that we're evaluating. And then the next node is the flood load range. And then the next node is breach. So this one's a, a pretty simple um, event tree here. Well, let's look at one that's, uh, let's look at another example. Um, so in this particular one, these nodes were constructed and they, as they should be based on the site characteristics and the modeling studies performed for this particular dam. In this example, the team combined a surface protection failure and a head cut initiation into a single node. It's recommended to use erosion models such as wind dam C and breach models to estimate rates for progression. Um, so you can see here we have our reservoir elevation at the beginning and what I want you to notice is there's a greater or less than symbol there. So the dam crest is at 945. So one node is when the water is greater than 945 and one node, or sorry, not node, but one branch off the first node is when it's above overtopping, it's above the dam crest. And the bottom one is when it's less than or equal to the dam crest. So if it is above the dam crest, and then the next node is surface protection of the downstream slope fails and head cut initiates. So if we say, yes, it does, yes, that um, fails and head cut does initiate. Then we go to the next node, which says head cut advances to the crest. 
And if we say yes, it does, then we go to the next node and we say breach progression and loss of reservoir. Okay. Uh, so, you can refer back to lecture C1 uh, for breach development, but the level of effort that we use to develop our um, event trees should be informed by the level of study, as I've mentioned already. Screening risk assessment for an embankment should be a different level of effort than a high order qualitative quantitative risk assessment. So, here we have kind of the information that you would need listed here. So for screening level, we're gonna estimate if the breach occurs based on familiarity with the existing case histories and personal experience. So we're not gonna put a lot of modeling into that effort. If we have an intermediate level study, we're gonna customize existing H&H &H analyses to estimate breach parameters. And we might use HECRAS um, in that. If we're doing a higher level or a rigorous um, uh, analysis, then we're going to want to use physically based models to estimate breach erosion rates with with expected formation and time to breach, um, such as wind dam, NWS breach, or HR breach, Embrya. So um, probably some of you are familiar with those those various um, softwares. Okay. So for concrete dams, so we've been talking about embankment dams, so now let's talk about concrete dams. So there's a few major factors that influence the likelihood of failure for overtopping for these types of structures. A key consideration is foundation jointing and materials. See chapter D1 on erosion of rock and soil for these details. Gates and their successful operation is also an important factor for concrete dams. Okay, so here's an example, concrete dam overtopping event tree. This event tree has four nodes, flood load ranges, erosion initiates, erosion undermines the dam, and extent of erosion fails the dam. Integration of hydraulics, rock mechanics, site geology, and foundation is performed to estimate probabilities for the last two nodes. There are several areas of uncertainty that we need to consider when we're talking about an overtopping failure mode. Hydrologic hazards is one main area on the left is a brief list from chapter B1. On the right, there are five areas, um, and we'll show some, or I will show some brief lists for each. So flood events, starting reservoir stages, reservoir operations or misoperation, spillway discharge, and modifications to the spillway. The initial reservoir surface elevation can be a critical input. Use of tools such as RMC RFA allow for direct consideration of variations in the initial reservoir level and the seasonality and routings. Operations and misoperations, particularly with gates, can shift reservoir stage frequency curves by an order of magnitude or more. So it's really important to look at scenarios that, um, that consider whether your gates are operating properly or not. Okay, there are sometimes large uncertainties in spillway discharges and rating curves for floods that are greater than the design event. Debris and gate hydraulics need to be evaluated. Embankment performance needs to include load partitions, overtopping duration, and surface protection. Additional factors that affect embankment performance can include zonation, slope breaks, erosion mechanism, and debris, and when we use sensitivity analysis and physical constraints to assess the soil erosion parameters and breach model results, we have a better um, understanding of what's going on for our event tree. Okay, so there are a few key takeaways from this presentation that I'd like you to make sure that you are taking with you. Overtopping flow and wave overwash could be a potential failure mode for both dams and levees. The specific erosion mechanism depends on the material the embankment is composed of, whether it's cohesive or cohesionless. Head cutting and sediment transport are important factors to consider. And a combination of both can happen. Depth and duration of overtopping are key factors. And erodibility of earthen embankment material is a key factor. Also, if you're talking about a concrete dam, erodibility of the foundation is a key factor. Does anybody have any questions for Carolyn? Carolyn, do we know what the impact of chimney filters is on erosion of embankments? That sounds like a geotech question. I'm going to tag one of my geotech friends, like Adam Goes. Yeah, so chimney filter, it's difficult to model, right? Because when we're using something like Windam, we can only use one zone. 
in the embankment and even when we're using something like DL breach where we can have two zones that's set up to model a core and then a shell. So it has to be qualitative. I, I would say in general, due to the relative size of, of chimney filters within embankments, it's not gonna have a large impact, but you can qualitatively take it into account based on the orientation and the geometry of the filter. Obviously, when you have a cohesive embankment and then a, a cohesionless filter, when you remove enough of the cohesive material, the filter isn't going to hold itself up. So it's not going to have a lot of structural integrity. So depending on the size, the location, orientation, it may make the breaching process occur a little bit faster, but I wouldn't say it would have a, a, a very large effect. occurs whether you're talking I have a pretty loud annoying voice but uh, things um, those features like that affect how long um, you it might take to get to breach including things like nick points on the downstream side that might focus flow and and cause head cutting to proceed quicker so and those those rates of um, failure affect our consequences right um, some assumptions that we make about how long it takes for a breach to occur affect who's who's warned and how long they have to, to evacuate. So um, all things merge into one. One more question over here. Sure. For odors and dams, do you consider the overbuild if settlement's shown to slow quite a bit, or do you actually look at the design elevation for the crest for overtopping? We like to look at the existing conditions of our embankments. Okay. So it's important to know what the design was because sometimes there may be, um, it's important to know any modifications that have happened to embankments because there may be failure modes associated with that. Um, and it may also impact um, how quickly we might think erosion might happen um, through that embankment also, so. And Carol mentioned in her and as I said yesterday, when you're modeling in a program such as Windam, it'll allow you to input the entire profile of the embankment. So you can put low spots, you can put high spots. So that will be accurately modeled if you have that information. But Settlement still occurring, we'd still use design at that time, right? No, we wouldn't. When we're doing a risk assessment, we're taking a snapshot in time. So we're going to be looking at the as existing conditions. So even if an embankment is designed so that eventually it'll reach, a, you know, that settlement will happen over time, we still want to look at it right now. But along with that, if the embankment has some more than was designed for, right. the uh, value of the existing condition <laughs> of recommendation might be for the embankment up to its design elevation based on whether what the overtopping might be. We have a question over here to the waiting session. Yeah. Can you comment on your experience of overtopping at Rockville dams? Um, I think it, <laughs> I, I would say that um, the way I've seen it evaluated and I'll, um, ask if you guys have some input on this as well, um, is that we typically take that into account in terms of duration, uh, how long we would think that it would take to erode through. Um, and usually I think it, it's, it withstands a little bit more than if it was just embankment um, uh, in terms of depth of duration, depth and duration. So I don't know if you have something. That's a, it's, it's a great question though, because rock fill can mean a lot of different things. Um, you can have rock fill of various gradation in some of our projects. Um, rock fill that has a pretty high percentage of weird clay in there um, can affect not only um, overtopping but also settlement and seismic response. So rock fill is an interesting character. Um, but generally, I think that's right. What Carolyn said is um, res it's difficult to do that. Windam, DL breach, they're not calibrated for rock fill. We can do our best and, and we have, um, but we all, we have to know that when we take the results, we have to take them with a grain of salt. We have a lot of research, a lot of case histories for overtopping of cohesive and cohesionless soils. There's not a lot for rock fill, rock fill embankments. So it, it comes into play in several locations. One, when, our, when we look at our modeling, we have to acknowledge that 
Rockville is going to be eroded differently than soil. But also when it comes to our breach sizes and our characteristics, there's, there's research that shows that Rockville breach geometries are a little bit different than soil breach geometries. Rockville tends to be moved downstream and it tends to pile up and it, it limits the overall size of the breach to be smaller than what the breach would be for, say, a, a cohesive or cohesionless soil embankment. So there's there's some qualitative factors more than anything that we have to factor in for Rockville, but we're working on trying to get better at modeling Rockville and evaluating Rockville embankments, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. So that's a, an example where we might look at, um, use the tools to look at a cohesionless material uh, of various gradations and a cohesive material and use qualitative tools to, to think about what Adam was talking about where, with some self armoring as, as the erosion continues and um, to say, well, what's more likely, what's less likely. Just a side comment, but uh, really important to understand what datums dams are uh, <laughs> excellent instructed on when you excellent. when you get old drawings. Yeah. So this is what the with the recent hydrologic modeling is. There can be you know uh, two or three or more datums that are associated with a project. <laughs> I've um, worked on a couple where there were four different datums, and we had to make sure that we were being consistent. So the core requires, based on our guidance, that all of our information is provided in NAVD 88, or you can use dual elevations and you can report both whatever the project datum is um, or the preferred project datum, as well as NAVD 88 and all of our tables and, and reporting. And that allows um, there to be consistency throughout the report and also it's really important to label it in the report that's one thing i like to harp on when i review is make sure you write down which datum you're talking about because often what happens i find is that somebody will flip to a page in a report maybe you talked about the datum in some little section earlier in the report but they're in this you know they're deep in the report and they don't know that you have a different datum somewhere else that you've talked about so unless you Everywhere in the report, you know what datum you're using. It can easily be misused later on. So um, that's actually one of my particular soapboxes. So thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and often, or sometimes, the project vernacular, like the culture of the project, talks about certain things in terms of a certain datum. Um, so that's another reason in the report to make sure it's clear um, what what your datum is. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions?